Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Disciplinary Core Idea PS1A, or it's the first one in the Physical Science series. This one's on the structure and properties of matter. What is matter? Matter is what the universe is made up of. And so this picture right here has the four phases of matter. We have solid, ice, so that'd be water in a solid form. We've got liquid water, we have gas, there's going to be a lot of water suspended in the air. And then we've got plasma, which is high energy particles. And so that's what the universe is made up of, matter. What is the matter made up of? It's made of atoms. And so everything uh, on our planet is going to be made up of atoms. Atoms themselves are made of smaller particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And even those are made of smaller particles. But we're not going to get much deeper than that. Know this, that everything on our planet is made up of around 100 atoms. And those are organized on the periodic table. This is at a museum in Tokyo. And what they do is they'll have hydrogen, for example, and then they're going to show you hydrogen gas or a little bit of lithium metal inside here. Um, so it's actually a periodic table of actual elements or pure substances. And so what should your students know? Well, in the early elementary grades, we should start to talk about substances and matter. And it's good to just use both of those terms. And they should be looking at matter. So they should be looking at metal, liquids, this is wood, this would be Play-Doh, which is going to be matter that's created by humans. Um, and we should look at properties of those. So from the beginning, they should be making observations of matter. What are some observations they could make in kindergarten, for example? Well, they could look at the texture or the textural observations. What does it feel like? They could look at the visual. What is it, you know, metals are clearly going to be shiny versus something like clay that's not going to be as shiny. Even oral observations. What does it sound like when we hit it? And if, and if safety is really, really important, make sure you're doing that. Even tasting it. How is it going to taste different if we're looking at different things? Also, we want to be looking at natural-made substances versus man-made substances. And so wood, for example, is going to be natural, but that Play-Doh I showed you just a second ago is going to be manufactured. Also, they should get this idea that matter is made up of smaller things. And we can talk about that as a concept. And so if you know what Legos are, Legos are going to be building blocks, but we can build those into bigger blocks. The, the students should start to understand that even the Legos are made of smaller particles, but we shouldn't even talk about atoms yet. As we move into the upper elementary grades, students should understand that if we take matter, so wood for example, and cut it into parts, it's still going to be wood. If we cut it again, it's still going to be wood. But if we keep cutting it smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually, if we could do that, it's not going to be visible anymore. Even though we're cutting it, it's, we can't see it. But it doesn't mean that the matter is not there. Um, and so as we get it smaller and smaller and smaller, we eventually get down to the level of atoms. And the word atomos means from indivisible. That's where the word actually comes from. And so your student, students should understand that everything is made up of these really small particles. But even though they might be invisible, invisible particles, it doesn't mean that they're not there. And so we can do observations to show that invisible particles exist. And so where are some invisible particles? Well, there's some right between you and me right now. So the air is not visible, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. So if I were to put air inside a balloon, we could clearly push on it, and it's going to push back. And so that would be an experiment we could do to show that these invisible particles actually exist. Or even looking at the leaves moving on the tree is evidence that shows me that those invisible particles actually exist. As we move through elementary, we should talk about the conservation of matter. What does that mean? It means that matter in general can't be created or destroyed. What's a really simple experiment you could do to show this? We could use a scale and take the mass of a certain amount of water. So we could get the mass of the water in the beaker. We could get the mass of sugar cubes. So we could take the masses separately. And then we could dissolve the sugar cubes in the water. And if we do that, we're going to find that the mass of those two at the beginning is going to be equal to the mass at the end. So even though we've dissolved the sugar in the water, it hasn't gone away. Uh, even though we can't see it, it's still there and the matter is going to be conserved. As we move then into uh, middle school, into the 7th, um, 8th kind of a grade, we should start to talk about atoms and give them names. And so there are around 100 different atoms that are going to make up all of the substances. Those atoms are organized into molecules. Now, what is a molecule? Let me go back and look at that again. So we've got an atom, and the atom are going to form molecules. Molecules are just going to be made from atoms connecting together. And so molecules can have two atoms, or they can have hundreds of atoms. Some will have thousands, like a big protein is going to have thousands of atoms. But they're still made up of, uh, molecules are still made up of atoms connected together. If we have a number of different atoms that are exactly the same, we call that a substance. And so this bar of gold right here is just made of gold. 
It's 250 kilograms of gold. That'd be over 13 million dollars worth of gold. But it's all made of these one type of atom, gold atoms. Or if we were to look at water, water is a molecule. You can see it's going to be hydrogen, excuse me, one oxygen and two hydrogens. But it still is a pure substance if we only have that because it's only one type of molecule. You should also start to talk about phases of matter. There are going to be three phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And I'm going to shoot over to a little animation that, or a little simulation that shows you how this works. This can be found at PHET, um, and I'll put a link in the video description down below. So if we were to look at neon, for example, and let me make it a solid, well, what does a solid look like? If this is solid neon, first of all, it's going to be really cold. 13K is 13 Kelvin, which is re really getting pretty close to absolute zero. You can see that the molecules are still vibrating and moving. If I were to make that a gas, now the molecules are going to be moving all around and bouncing off the sides. And if I were to make it a liquid, what does a liquid look like? Well, they're not just going to be vibrating in place. They're going to be sliding past one another. And as they do that, they're going to fill the container. And the simulation is kind of slow. But eventually what will happen is all the liquid is going to settle on the bottom. And so what would that look like with oxygen? Or excuse me, let's go to water. What does water look like? Well, if it's a solid, it's going to form ice. It's still going to vibrate, it's still going to move, but it's going to form these nice hydrogen bonds. As we make it a liquid, then they'll slide past one another and it'd fill up the container. And then if we make it a gas, it's going to be bouncing out throughout that whole container. And this is a cool simulation and we can play with it. And so let's play with this, for example. What things are going to change us from one matter to another? Well, let's look what happens if we start to heat up the neon. So as we start to heat up the neon or add heat to it, it's going to start turning, first of all, into a liquid. And then if we keep heating it, it's eventually going to turn into a gas. And so as we add temperature, then we can change it from one phase to another. If I add some ice right now, I'm going to cool it down. What's that eventually going to become? It's eventually going to become a liquid, and then it'll become a solid if I let it sit long enough. And so temperature is one thing that can affect the phases of matter. Um, what's another thing that could do it is uh, pressure. And so if I start to apply pressure on here, I can change the fa phases of matter as well. But I have to be careful. If I push it too hard, uh, I'm going to explode my container. OK, so let's go back to talking about matter. Um, as we move into high school then, we should really talk about the parts of an atom. And so what's an atom made up of? It's made up of a nucleus. And that nucleus is going to have two subatomic particles in it. We're going to have protons. Those are red here. And they're going to be positive in nature. And then we're going to have neutrons, which are going to be neutral. They don't have any kind of a charge. Those are going to be in the nucleus, and it's incredibly small. So like in a football stadium, if you think of that the size of an atom, if we could blow up an atom to that size, the nucleus is really only going to be about the size of a ping pong ball right in the middle on the 50-yard line. So again, nucleus is incredibly small. What goes around the nucleus, what's the rest of the atom? Uh, it's mostly made of electrons. It's these clouds of probability where the electrons may or may not exist. And those are going to be negative in charge. And so those are the three parts of an atom. We organize the atoms that we have identified on our periodic table. And it's organized like this. The first one's going to be hydrogen. And then as we move to the right and then down, we're going to increase the number of protons. And so we know that hydrogen is going to have one proton because it has an atomic number of one. Helium was what we were just looking on the previous slide. Helium is going to have an atomic number of two. That means it has two protons. And so you can just look anywhere on the periodic table. Gold, for example, 79. We know that it has exactly 79 protons in the nucleus. How else is the periodic table organized? Well, you'll find that it's going to have these columns. And those columns are related to properties, but they're more related to the outer electron uh, states. In other words, the electrons on the outer level. And so there's cool things we can find. Like all of these are going to be noble gases. In other words, these are going to be stable gases like helium, neon, argon, krypton. We can put all these in a tube and make a neon light. We might find if we look here that copper, silver, and gold, you know that those are all going to have similar properties. And that's because of those electrons on the outer level. Or if we were to look at these in this first column, uh, hydrogen is going to be a gas, but everything else is going to be a solid, and it's going to be highly reactive. So if we mix, mix lithium, sodium, or potassium with water, we're going to get an explosion. And so again, looking vertically is going to tell us a lot about the behavior of the atoms, and that's due to their outer electron levels. So what makes matter matter? Going back to what they should have talked about in elementary school, it's going to be these electrons on the outer level. And so why is water conduct, or excuse me, metal conduct electricity? Why is it shiny or wood not? 
it has to do those electrons on the outer level. And in fact, when I'm touching my hands together and pushing them, they're not really touching each other. It's the electrons that are hovering kind of over each other at, a, at this really microscopic level. And so one thing you should know is that what makes matter behave the way they do is these electrical forces. And so they try to become stable, stable both in their electron states outside and then inside. So there's a term you should become familiar with, it's called binding energy. What does that mean? Well, reactants and products are going to have different amounts of energy. And so in a quick reaction, we've got oxygen and hydrogen, and they're inherently going to be unstable gases, and they're going to combine to form something called water. What's a real world example of that? The Hindenburg, when it started on fire, the hydrogen was burning. In other words, the hydrogen is mixing with the oxygen in the air, and we got a huge amount of energy. That energy is called binding energy. It's the difference between the energy of an unstable molecule and one that's stable. And so this is an exergonic reaction. We're losing energy. And where's that energy going? It's being released as, as heat and light. Now we have to put a little spark into that. We call this activation energy. You have to put some energy into it to get it going. But that's going to be binding energy. If we reverse that, um, this is water right here that we're running electricity through. And so what we're doing is adding energy to it. Now we're adding energy to the water. And as we do that, we can break that water back into its oxygen and hydrogen. And what's neat about this experiment is you're going to have twice as much hydrogen, twice as much hydrogen gas, because there's going to be two atoms of hydrogen for one atom of oxygen. Uh, but we have to put energy into the system. What's an example of that? Well, leaves are doing that. They're taking energy from light and storing it in their food. Well, who are they making the food for themselves? They can then break that down and they can release that binding energy as energy to grow. And so that's the structure and the function of matter or properties of matter. And I hope that was helpful.